Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our coffee chats. Uh, I'm Melissa Jackson, director of Snohomish STEM, powered by Economic Alliance Snohomish County, and co-director of Career Connect Northwest. Thank you for joining us for today's important discussion from barriers to benefits, aligning childcare policies with workforce needs. Today, we aim to shed light on a critical issue facing our community, the access to early learning and childcare and its profound impact on our workforce. As we all know, a strong and resilient workforce is the backbone of a thriving economy. Yet, the lack of affordable and accessible childcare options remains a significant barrier for many working families, affecting businesses and our overall economic health. Our panel of esteemed experts will explore innovative solutions to better align childcare policies with workforce needs. We will also share insights from an ongoing survey being conducted among regional businesses, highlighting the tangible effects of childcare challenges on their bottom line. Today's event is interactive and we encourage you to participate by asking questions and sharing your thoughts in chat. You can start off right now by introducing yourself and dropping your name and organization. We'd love some shout outs. Together, we can contribute to a vital conversation on how supporting early learning and childcare initiatives can help build a stronger, more resilient workforce. Um, so to kick things off, please help me in welcoming our panel, Paige Coleman. Paige is the Program Manager of Family-Friendly Workplaces, the employer-supported child care technical assistance program at the Washington State Department of Commerce. Next up, Debbie Carlson. Debbie is the Manager of Snohomish County Early Learning Coalition, striving to make excellence in early learning achievable and sustainable for every child in Snohomish County. Following her, we have Marie Keller. Marie is the Director of Facility Growth and Development at the Imagine Institute, supporting affordable, high quality care for every child in Washington State by building an accessible, strong, and diverse development system that elevates and improves the lives of child care providers and professionals. We also are joined by Kenda Sipma. Kenda is the Child Care Recruitment and Expansion Manager at the Center for Retention and Expansion of Child Care Northwest and Lori Saline. Lori is the Assistant Director of Quality Child Care Division, also with the Center for Retention and Expansion of Child Care Northwest, also known as CREC. CREC Northwest focuses on stabilizing, retaining, and expanding the capacity and the number of child care businesses across five counties, Whatcom, Island, San Juan, Skagit, and Snohomish. We will also be joined by Dr. Soleil Boyd. Soleil is the Senior Program Officer at Washington STEM, a statewide education nonprofit leveraging STEM for social change, removing barriers to credential attainment, and creating pathways to long-term economic security for systematic, systema, systemically excuse me, underserved students. Thank you all for being here. We are thrilled to have such a knowledgeable and diverse group of speakers with us today. Let's dive into this essential topic and explore ways to transform barriers into benefits for our workforce and community. Soleil is here, great. So to kick things off. I'm here. <laughs> great, thank you Soleil. <laughs> to set the tone for today's discussion, Dr. Soleil Boyd will now share current child care data for Washington State and Snohomish County, followed by a brief demonstration of the cost of running a child care business in Snohomish County. Soleil, please take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, and are you able to see my slides? Yes, we can see your screen on the uh, deck. And it is my slides, right? Not some other random thing. Okay, great. Good. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, good morning and thanks for having me here. I'm so glad I can, um, can make it. Apologies. I had some technical difficulties getting online, but here we are. 2024, still doing it. Uh, as Alyssa mentioned, I'm Soleil Boyd and I work at Washington STEM, the, and we are all the things she just shared. Um, and so you may be wondering why Washington STEM is in the business of 
early care and education and child care. And uh, it's because we know that great uh, STEM teaching, learning and, and careers start early. Um, and that young children really need those foundations. And a critical part of that foundation is access to high quality early care and education. So we really operate as a cradle to career continuum organization. Um, and so these are our efforts in the early stages of life. Um, and I'm just gonna talk about a few things uh, in kind of the Northwest region and Snohomish County in particular. And one is just the overall state of young children a bit to ground us in, in, in who are these young children you all care and about and serve um, and moving into really the issues of access and affordability that are impacting um, Snohomish County and the broader region. Uh, I'll then share a little bit about a project we have called the Child Care Feasibility Estimator and provide an example of what it can look like to uh, run a child care um, in the county of Snohomish. Uh, and then a little bit later, I think Alyssa may pitch it back to me for some, some information on current initiatives and policies. Um, and Alyssa, you just feel free to say time uh, and I'll keep it moving. All right. So just to ground us a bit in the overall state of young children in the region and in the county. Um, so the Northwest region is inclusive of San Juan Island, Skagit, Snohomish and Whatcom counties. Um, and these are this is sort of the area that Washington STEM and the Washington Communities for Children uh, have identified as that broader Northwest region. Um, and in that region, there are nearly 90,000 children under the age of six. Uh, and over 20% of them uh, live in low income households. So that's a really significant portion. And, and we define low income as that 200% federal poverty line um, or below. Um, the most common languages other than English spoken in the home are Spanish and Korean. And 46% of the children in the region are children of color. So I think probably everybody on this call knows this is a really diverse and dynamic region with a lot of industries, a lot of families um, representing a really broad array of backgrounds. Um, of those nearly 90,000, about 70,000 children live in Snohomish County. So that's a really, really important space, right? Uh, important area. And um, we continue to see really, significant amounts of diversity there. So you'll see here kind of a screen grab of one of our, our data charts, um, our data dashboard that demonstrates the, the racial diversity of the county in comparison to the state. And it's pretty, pretty similar. So just over half of the children in Snohomish County are white. Uh, this is according to the Census Bureau. Bureau, about 21% are from Latino or Latina homes. Um, 11% two or more races, followed by Asian families, um, Black and African families, American Indian and Native American, and followed by Native Hawaiian and additional um, Pacific Islander communities. So again, I'm, I'm not telling you anything you don't know about your community, but I think it's important as we consider the kinds of care options that are necessary to be culturally aligned, linguistically aligned, that we're really mindful of uh, that demographic makeup of the region and of the county. Uh, a, a bit more on that, just in terms of language uh, and thinking about <clears throat> language access uh, in the county, again, it, it mirrors a lot of um, what's true in Washington state with those who speak a language other than English at home. Um, the, the majority of that is Spanish or the largest portion of that at 29%. Uh, followed by other Asian and Pacific Island languages, um, other Indo-European languages, and, and so on. So again, and you can see more about this at some of our data dashboards at WashingtonSTEM.org, um, some of those language uh, representations. Okay, so let's talk about access and affordability. Uh, so it just broadly in Washington state, um, we can see, so red is bad. Uh, blue is good, and it's not great for anyone anywhere. Uh, and so in Snohomish County, uh, you know, at about 10 to 20 percent of children have access to the child care they need. That is unfortunately um, not, not unique. 
Uh, and so we know that as a state, we have really big challenges to overcome in making sure all young children get the early care uh, education opportunities that, that, are, that should be theirs. But let's zoom in a little bit on Snohomish County overall, or specifically, and, and um, you can see this, and, and at, when I'm done, I'll drop some links in the chat, um, but you can see this at actually dcyf.gov. Um, uh, these are the need and supply dashboards. So these dashboards represent need and supply. So we define need, and this is a partnership Washington STEM has with the Department of Children, Youth, and Families to really visualize and help folks, like everybody here, think about, wow, where do we really need to prioritize and think really carefully about our, our child care approach? Uh, and so, um, but we define need as a child in a family with all parents or all um, caregivers in the workforce. We assume that's a family that needs some form of care. And then we define supply as those uh, providers who are providing licensed child care or Head Start or ECAP. Um, and so that is where we kind of get these ratios, right? Uh, and so, and it ranges, right? So you saw the state, there's, there's a range. Okay, well, same as in, in Snohomish County. Um, and it goes from the low of 0%, and, and these are zip codes, uh, in the 98256 zip code. So there's about 51 children in that zip code, uh, according to the census, and that's where indexes and some other communities. Um, and there's no child care there for them. And that ranges up to the high of 35% in 98210, so that's in the Everett, Everett area, right? So even when we have the most childcare uh, of any zip code, it's still not nearly enough for the need that is out there. Uh, and if you wanna look, kind of break that down by age, it really varies and it's not, it's not really that much better um, or it gets, it gets more challenging for depending on what age your child is. Um, so you can see here for infants, in the county, about 11% of the infants who need care have access, 17% of toddlers, 26% of preschool age children, and then actually the lowest is, is school age children at 8% have access to the care they need. So um, I think it's probably not news. If you're on this call, you know there's a crisis, um, but it, I think it can be important to be specific to think about, again, how do we prioritize and target our approach? Um, and the, the price varies varies uh, a great deal as well. Um, and so that can range anywhere from $5,000 a year for school age care up to $18,000 a year. These are statewide, av statewide averages. Um, and so this is a, a massive amount of family income. Um, and in Snohomish County specifically, if you have two children in childcare, that's about $30,000 a year. That's almost 30% of the average income. Um, and that is a major burden on families. So we, we have a, a lot of work to do to make this affordable and accessible. Um, so why is it so expensive? Oh my gosh, this is wild. Like, how could that possibly be true? Okay, well, we wondered that and we did a little, <laughs> we're Washington Sim, so we had to do a little math. We made a, we made a calculator. We call it an estimator because, uh, because our, our accountant told us to do that. Um, and because we, we don't want people to think, oh, this is the, tr the, the answer, but more, this is an estimate of what it really takes when you think about running your childcare business. Um, and I know there's some other experts on the, on the call, Marie and I talked a bit as we developed this and others. Uh, so please jump in if you're like, you know what? No, I would run my childcare differently. And that's great. And that's why you have that job and you help people do that. Uh, but here's just, just a little uh, kind of overview of what you may be wondering, what on earth is going on uh, if this is not your business? So if you go to the child care estimator, uh, you'll have the opportunity to enter information about the facility um, of your child care. And let me see if I can zoom in a little bit more here. But, uh, and so you can enter things like, okay, we're in Snohomish County. We want to run a family home. And let's say I have a really nice, big, beautiful basement and 800 square feet of usable space. How lovely. Um, and so here's where you can go and just enter different information. And 
Um, I want to, I'm going to drop a link in the chat in a moment so that folks can kind of play in this. Cause I think that's where it gets interesting as you can adjust these numbers and see, well, what if I change this? What if I tweak that? Would that make a difference in my business? Um, and there's some additional information here about, you know, are you participating in our state's quality initiative? Um, early achievers, uh, do you have a registration fee? Do you provide scholarships and discounts? So I added a bit of that here. Okay, so that's a bit about, about my program in Snohomish County. So now I need to think about operating expenses. Um, so how many of these children are qualifying for the subsidy and will receive the state subsidy? Let's say 50%. Um, and then how many or how much do I plan to spend on program expenses? Uh, so this could be new Play-Doh. I used to be a teacher. You should make your own Play-Doh for starters. But if you want to buy it, that's fine. Um, and, and, and much more than that. I don't want to oversimplify things. But just so you, you kind of get the gist. Um, rent and other occupancy. And so if you go into the estimator, these little orange bubbles will give you some hints. Like, hey, think about this. Think about that. So if you're not sure, it will, it will help you. Um, collections rate, we're expecting 97%, uh, so on and so forth, right? And so I am entering all this information and you can see there's really quite a few costs, right? A lot of expenses. Okay, well now who's gonna be in our childcare? Let's say we have capacity for about 12 kids, two will be babies, two will be toddlers, six will be preschoolers, two will be school age. And, and you can start to see why there's more preschool childcare than there is the other ages. Um, it, it relative to the staffing ratio, it brings in the most dollars um, and it's where you can really increase that access, honestly, the most effectively. Um, and the price here is about $1,300. So the estimator will also let you kind of clue into what are the averages and what's the range in this county or region that you're in. Um, and then additional prices that, that I won't go into on the screen grab, but. Okay, next slide, staffing and compensation. Do you wanna provide benefits? I hope so, right? That's really important. Um, and average at the low end per year per employee is $6,000. Um, what kind of wages are we thinking? We're at just above minimum wage at $18 an hour for that staff person. Um, and so we continue. So there's some more information on wages. And if you hit the button at the end and it goes, doo, 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 doo. okay, so here is the end. And, and listen, maybe you're cueing me. So I'll keep it, I'll wrap it up here. But uh, so while you have really, really wanted to provide this wonderful care to your community, here is how it all comes out. Total revenue per year, $178,000. But total expenses are 189. Okay, and so this is an annual loss of you know almost twelve thousand dollars a year, um, which is a little bit hard to jump into with both feet, right? And so a lot of people, when they start preparing or thinking about how they want to open their childcare, they really need a lot of help, right? And that's what the Imagine Institute does, and other folks do. But it is also a really intense balancing act of trade-offs and considerations about how will you raise the revenue you need to cover those expenses while maintaining that really high quality of care that children need and deserve um, to reach their potential while we support working families. So, so this is one example. You could run a few more models and, and, and it's a fun game. <laughs> which model will get you to, to black. Uh, and you can play that game on your own, but uh, we'll drop a link and you can, you can explore the tool. Uh, also, there is a much more detailed breakdown. If you go, that can't possibly be true. You can break it down and look really specifically at those totals to see what part of this business is bringing and, and costing and where can I make those adjustments? So uh, I'll pause there um, and, and I don't know if there's questions or Alyssa, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Soleil. Um, I think there's two things in there that really stood out to me. One, I um, hope you all caught the cost of uh, childcare. And if you don't already know it deeply personally yourself, uh, it can be uh, more than double the cost of sending your, your children to community college. So we know that. Um, and, and another thing that stands out is we often use the term childcare desert. 
So Snohomish County is a child care desert, as Sully pointed out. None of the zip codes were were hitting or serving the need. So thank you, Sully, for dropping through, uh, uh, walking us through that. And that feasibility estimator was shows us it's not just as easy as uh, just open more child care providers or centers like that is that's not there's not just one answer here and it's not just that because she walked us through the cost of running a child care uh, uh, center or provider and um, it's hard that's tricky so thank you Soleil. Um so now let's jump back into the data from our ongoing survey for businesses uh, which asked about the impact of lack of child care on hiring and retention so we've we've seen the data we know that they were in a desert, we're not meeting the need. And now we surveyed businesses and organizations from Snohomish County and across the region to hear from you directly. So I'm gonna actually cover this with a couple of slides myself. And here we go. Okay, so as I mentioned, our survey is ongoing. So this runs, um, Till the end of August. So if you haven't filled it out yourself or your organization hasn't filled it out, please do so. Uh, we'll be sending links. Rachel will send out a follow-up email after today's uh, event that has links to all of the resources that have been shared already that will be shared as well as a link to the survey. And if you aren't sure who should fill it out, we made a quick list for you. Business leaders, HR professionals, policymakers. Um, and so if it's not you, please make sure you get this to someone in your organization. We want to make sure that you are in the data um, as we join together to uh, create a thriving business environment for everyone. Okay, so I promised you we'd, talk, we'd take a little preview of the data. Uh, and this is data so far. This was made a couple weeks ago. We have received new submissions since then. Um, so this is just a snapshot. So let's take a look at who completed the survey. Uh, well, the top industries that showed up in our survey uh, are healthcare, social assistance, professional, scientific, technical services, nonprofits, and manufacturing. And this tracks, this is reflective of top industries in our county and in our region. And then really tied for fifth fifth and sixth, uh, we had quite a few that were tied. So I wanted to make sure that I highlighted those as well. Hospitality, construction, education, retail, real estate, and government. We're all really closely tied for fifth and sixth place there. So we're seeing this. This, this looks like our the makeup of our region. Um, another who that we can look at was employee count. What size of businesses completed the survey? And something that was of note to us was that 65% uh, of those surveyed have 25 or fewer employees. Uh, and here's the breakdown of what that looks like. One to five employees, six to 10 employees, 11 to 25. So some of these are even those micro businesses. And I think you could infer a lot from this. Um, I'll throw a couple, you know, maybe this shows us that childcare or lack of childcare is impacting smaller businesses, micro businesses at a higher rate, maybe. Maybe they know their workforce uh, more closely, more deeply, and so they um, they know this is an issue. Maybe, maybe they um, they didn't have to wonder who from HR should fill it out. It's them. They fill out the survey. Uh, so there, I think there's a lot of reasons of why we saw small business really show up in here. But I wanted to make sure uh, we all saw that. Okay, so another who that we're diving in. So that was the industry we see. We definitely see small business in the data. Now let's look at them as a whole. What percent of your workforce has childcare needs? The top answer was about 20 to 33% of their workforce has childcare needs. Uh, pretty close behind it was 50 to 100% of their workforce. So it's a need. The vast majority of the workforce has childcare needs, period. Um, and since we talked about small business on the last slide, I wanted to take a closer look at large employers on this slide. Of the large employers who we identified of having 51 to 500 plus employees, um, uh, at the time when we made this deck, we had 13 responses that were from the large employees, uh, or excuse me, employers, and their top answer was 25 to 50% of their workforce. So even when you're looking at small business, large business, the vast majority of workforce overall has, work, uh, has childcare needs. So we know this is an issue. So they already showed us the data. 
we're hearing from our data from our own survey, this is an issue. And in fact, we were curious how much of this is impacting your ability to retain or hire people. So we called that question outright. Do you have trouble retaining or hiring people due to childcare challenges? The 63% and the blue in the bottom said yes. Uh, there's about 11% that said unknown. And again, I kind of made some ponderings and inferences earlier. So maybe they aren't sure uh, if they if it's an issue um, or maybe they aren't the ones doing the hiring. So there could be a lot of answers there. But yes, this is an issue. So we know it's an issue for the, the parents and the guardians. We know it's an issue for the businesses. Okay, we're on the, we're, we're on the right subject here. Okay, so we talked about the who. Yes, it's an issue. And let's learn a little bit. What are your current benefits you offer? What are some current barriers? Um, we made a list of about nine, uh, nine childcare benefits. And we asked, does your business or organization offer any of the following benefits? And the top answer was no, <laughs> none. <laughs> we do not offer any of those uh, nine from that list. Um, and I wanted to make sure that we pointed out um, this number two answer was a big drop from 56% down to 17%. Um, but we, there are some organizations that are offering dependent care, flex spending accounts, referrals for childcare, um, vouchers, stipends, reimbursements. So there is some, some going ons. Um, okay, so what are the barriers preventing you from offering these childcare benefits? Um, if you want to drop in chat, I'll try to stall for 30 seconds or here. Any ideas or guesses of what are some of the top barriers preventing an organization from offering child care benefits? Number one, money, uh, followed by infrastructure and lack of knowledge. Uh, of these three barriers, we're hoping to address uh, and work on one of those today, the lack of knowledge. We know that today we've got an excellent panel um, and they all have great ideas, resources, ways for you to plug in, ways for you to learn and um, what's uh, get some technical assistance for your organization, as well as maybe even be a part of the broader solution. What are some ideas? How do we help solve this problem? It is not gonna be a one, one size fit all. It's not just open more childcare centers or providers. We know that, so let's get together. Okay, let's talk potential benefits. So you currently don't offer any of the nine from the list, um, but what benefits would you offer if those barriers were removed? And um, of the nine, six of them rated uh, about 50%, 40 to 50% wanted to, so they wanna offer, if the barriers could be removed, they would offer all the things. Um, and just for quick reference, the three that were not hit, hitting 40% or above were, uh, child on on-site child care, near site child care, and sponsored child care spots. So this is just a snapshot of the survey data. Um, and now we've heard about data from you all, the data from um, our state. Let's dive into Q and A with our panelists. Um, and as a reminder for those of us joining via Zoom, please enter any questions for our panel in the chat and we'll relay them to our guest speakers, time permitting. Okay, so first up, Paige. We're hearing in the survey that one of the top barriers preventing businesses from offering childcare benefits is the lack of knowledge of options. Where should they start? And what are some examples of successful family-friendly workplace policies you've helped to implement? Thank you, Alyssa. It's a pleasure to join you today. Attending this webinar is actually a great place for employers to start. The Washington State Department of Commerce has been working on child care related issues and solutions for many years because it's important to our communities and our economy. We have three child care related programs, the Child Care Partnership Grants, Early Learning Facilities Fund, and Family Friendly Workplaces. In 2018, we staffed the Child Care Collaborative Task Force and learn from this large group of diverse stakeholders and their reports. Our employer supported child care technical assistance program was actually inspired by their recommendations. In hearing your survey results on the need for employers and their interest to know more about options, this is in line with what we're working on at the Family Friendly Workplace Program Initiative to better understand the range of options that an employer may consider and to share these solutions in a way that supports the employer. This also resonates with what we've learned when we 
began our work two years ago with listening sessions and surveys. Employers in Washington State were and still are interested in learning about solutions. They indicated particular interest in technical assistance to learn and have support from finance and HR experts. As a result, we contract business experts in these specific areas to help research employer-based strategies and provide no-cost consultations and trainings like our cohort program. We are developing a family-friendly workplace framework and have identified about 20 strategies so far that an employer may consider individually or bundle as benefits and offerings. This is just a tip of the iceberg of possibilities. Of the 20 strategies, only one is on-site childcare. Many of these solutions are scalable, where a business of any size may put them into policy and practice. These solutions may help address the company's needs regarding recruitment, retention, absenteeism, productivity issues, while also helping to address workforce childcare needs. We have learned and continue to understand how important it is for, to meet employers where they are. Our consulting and training approach reflects this with beginning with assessment and feasibility testing for what makes sense for the business itself. It's encouraging to see that over 70% of your survey respondents indicated interest in learning more about the cohort program. In partnership with local economic development councils and workforce boards, we're in the process of piloting our family-friendly workplace employer cohort model, which brings together business leaders to learn and share practices over a short three months. The feedback that we have received so far is that it's helpful to have a dedicated time and space to focus on this priority, especially with experts and other employers in the room. In consultation sessions and employer cohorts, we encourage employers to start with understanding their own business need and what their own employees need. And so I wanted to share a few examples of um, the what employers are exploring and progressing towards becoming more of a family-friendly workplace. So just briefly, um, one employer had a policy that did not let children at their workplace, yet some supervisors allowed kids to come to work regardless of that policy. So the leadership took a look at that um, and reviewed the particular policy that was preventing kids on campus and how it impacted their culture. So after that closer look, they changed the policy to allow children in ways that would be reasonable and safe and also adopted a family-friendly workplace culture statement. Another added a bring your child to work policy as a result of what they learned during the employer cohort, particularly from other employers in the room. It's interesting to note that the person who identified this policy as a good solution for their company actually did not do that for their own needs, but did change this as a result of what they learned in the cohort from other employers. An employer, another employer adopted a flexibility policy to address attrition and the loss of employees due to tardiness related to childcare. Recently, an employer extended their policy definition of what qualified for volunteer hours to include volunteering at a local school. Employers serve on local child care coalitions that may be funded by Commerce's child care partnership grants, and employers also participate in um, the efforts to build or renovate child care centers that are close um, or nearby. And they may be involved in applications to Commerce's Early Learning Facilities Fund. So these are just a few examples of how an employer can begin with what's manageable for their own organization and business. We consider it a journey for an employer to become more of a family-friendly workplace. It may not be just one solution. It's a um, process, an iterative development process that over time that takes a lot of consideration, planning of understanding the problem, and then looking at what offerings and benefits may be most useful for one's unique workforce. Um, and ultimately, we encourage developing a family-friendly workplace culture. Uh, we encourage and help employers to think through the range of possibilities that may work for them. And as you can see in what I've shared, um, it's quite a, a full continuum of possibilities. 
Um, but certainly it always begins with understanding one's own business or organization, their unique workforce needs, and then determining what do they have the capacity to do. So we look forward to continuing to learn and discover what we can be doing that's most helpful and how employers can become more family friendly as a workplace. Thank you so much for the time to join you today. Awesome. Thank you, Paige. Uh, the, and this cohort she mentions, um, there's limited availability but or limited capacity. So I know you're doing them around uh, the state and I believe uh, we have EDAS from Skagit County here and I know that you're gonna be working with them uh, coming up. So we hope to have one in Stohomish County uh, to follow. And I've seen a few elected officials or some organizations in the room. So I just want to give a shout out to Senator Robinson. I saw uh, uh, Rep. Del Benny's, uh, uh, excuse me, Representative Del Benny's office in here. So um, thanks for attending and being part of the conversation. And oh, there's, oh, there she is right there. Hi, <laughs> Senator Jean Robinson. Um, this is an issue for our community and we're so glad that you're here and, and um, uh, able to uh, help spread the word. I, I could give you the floor. If you wanted to say anything, I wanted to make sure you had the space too. Um, otherwise a happy wave is fine too. Uh, no, I, I just, um, it's a very important issue. Thank you for, um, to EASC for uh, bringing it forward. And uh, we know that it impacts families, kids, employers, um, and the state. I'm, I'm glad Commerce is here. Um, thank you, Paige. The, state and state legislature is um, working hard um, to address this issue. Although as we know, it's, it's hard and complicated and expensive. And I, you know, I don't think we have a perfect solution, but I am really thrilled to see people talking about a range of options and um, a wide variety of partners because that's what it's going to take. So thank you for giving me this time and I'm just happy to be here. Yes, thank you. Thank you for um, jumping in. Yeah, and it will take a lot of offer, uh, a lot of, um, there's a lot of paths, a lot of solutions forward. And so um, one of them is making sure that we're hearing from our providers. Uh, and so Kenda and Laura, Lori, uh, what are you hearing from potential childcare providers on barriers that they are facing and starting up their business? And how are you supporting both childcare providers and businesses who are interested in starting a childcare center? Hi, Alyssa, good morning. Thanks for having us today. Um, we find that many prospective childcare business owners could benefit from business, small business education. So for example, what is their business structure? Are they structured as an LLC, an S Corp? Are they keeping their business and personal accounts separate? Do they have proper insurances? Do they have an accountant who is knowledgeable in childcare business? And even are they saving for retirement? Because we know that that's something that's really important to plan for. In addition, understanding DCYF licensing regulations, including owner and staff credentialing is often overwhelming for those who are new to this sector. And to comply with DCYF licensing, the Washington administrative codes that we regularly see need building improvements, such as minor renovations, plumbing upgrades, and uh, early learning buildings also need to comply with local codes, which can re require permits and building improvements as well. Some of these uh, larger barriers are very costly and take a lot of time. So for example, um, specific fire marshal requirements we've seen are installing fire suppression systems, adding proper exit signs and lighting, adding more egresses. We've also seen um, in rural areas required septic upgrades, water system upgrades. We have also seen um, the need for traffic studies. So the local permitting process we know can take months and it's costly. And while this is happening, um, there's often no uh, revenue being generated by the business while that is all happening. So it can just be very overwhelming that initial startup costs and just trying to get that revenue generating. If a provider does find a building to renovate for an early learning center, another challenge is then finding staff. 
In order to increase and sustain the childcare workforce, we need to be recruiting early learning teachers into this sector and educate the public to understand that early learning and care is an investment that has a multi-generational impact on the economy. Uh, my supervisor, Lori Sailing, is here, and I believe she wanted to make some comments about how we are supporting um, the supervisor, or sorry, the providers and the businesses. Lori? Hi, thank you, Kendra. Welcome. Um, thank you, everybody, for having us here to share um, our work. Uh, um, and speaking to those um, uh, startup costs, it, it, that is a huge barrier of actually finding a space um, and making it meet local um, permitting, um, licensing codes, and then you plug in the budget that Soleil shared, that's wonderful tool, but you have up to 70 to 100,000 sometimes in some cases for some childcare providers to actually make that 800 square foot space um, meet all the coding requirements to actually run the early learning center. Um, and then you need staff. And so an exciting, um, opportunity that's happening um, in Snohomish County as the Community Action Agency Snohomish County has dedicated some of their ARPA money to uh, a project with Opportunity Council and Everett Community College um, where that funding is going towards ECE um, teachers um, and providers to meet their educational requirements so that they can continue to work in the early childhood center. So um, that is really working towards that barrier and need of um, having the staff and retaining that staff um, without them having to pay out of pocket for that coursework to continue their credentials. Um, our um, CREC program um, really has that relationship-based approach to work with providers um, to run a successful startup and run a successful childcare business um, and educational program, that combination. Um, and so I think that that is the biggest barrier is really that business side of making um, a solid business plan and having us there alongside with those folks to open up their business and build their educational program to meet the need of the community and the employers. Um, another thing that CREC has done is really um, is brokering those partnerships with businesses and um, child care providers. Um, we just completed one in Skagit with an uh, agricultural business um, and a local child care provider. Um, who are providing childcare for that business with their unique needs um, of ours, and it's bilingual with uh, Spanish and Misteco um, to meet the diverse needs of that community. So um, we're really um, trying to implement all the things that um, Paige has shared and others have shared um, with those providers and working alongside them. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And you mentioned ECE for those in the chat or for those oh, who maybe sorry. aren't familiar. It's okay. Um, early childhood education. And so this is, there's a pipeline, right? So yes, maybe starting the business, but you also need staff, as we've heard a few times, they need to be trained, there's certain qualifications. Um, uh, you mentioned some ARPA dollars. I see Snohomish County uh, in attendance here. So uh, shout out to them for um, uh, the surveying they did that this was an issue that they needed to uh, work on. There was another uh, early childhood education program that was also brought back with some support from uh, ARPA dollars, which was uh, a CTE, career technical education. There's some courses in the high school for students that they can take to help prepare them if they're going into this. And so um, that's another one. And so working to address the workforce pipeline. <clears throat> Debbie, let's jump to you. How does the Snohomish, early, Snohomish County Early Learning Coalition engage with local businesses and community organizations to address childcare issues? Well, thank you, Alyssa and the Alliance for having me here this morning. Um, so I manage the Snohomish County Early Learning Coalition and we are a coalition of over a hundred members throughout Snohomish County of early learning professionals and families and parents. And what we have been identifying with active early learning leaders um, in Snohomish County for the past year is that one, recognizing that with all the data that you just heard, Snohomish County is the third largest county in the state and we're one of the fastest growing counties in the nation. And one of the things that we know is Snohomish County is really rich in um, alliances and partnerships um, with different organizations and providers, families working together. But what we saw as an opportunity is an overarching um, unifying council 
um, that could really direct some solutions and identify issues as well as solutions. So we approached um, one of our partners in the legislature, uh, Representative Cortez, with an idea to launch an early learning, uh, early learning leadership council. We also recognize that as, as large as Nahomish County is and as fast as it's growing and as um, the data has already suggested, there is there are childcare deserts both in our urban areas as well as in our urban areas or in, as well as in our rural areas that we really needed partnership with business, with law enforcement, early learning providers to really come together and find um, systemic solutions, but also to identify more data, evidence-based data to really guide us in those recommendations. And so we partnered with Representative Cortez, um, asking for some assistance and helping to launch a leadership council. We received, and we were really proud to have received $200,000 from the legislature. And thank you, Senator Robinson, for your support. Um, but we are about to launch a leadership council uh, in this year to really come up with um, systemic solutions um, that really are about public part, pu both public and private partnerships, um, and to think about specifically the unique needs within Snohomish County, and how can we really further address those needs. Um, and like I said, really including business voices. Um, early learning professionals and leaders, elected officials at the city, county, and state level, um, as well as families and parents. And so with that, and then we're also, we also got some funding to be able to dive deep into um, uh, digging deep into a localized report of really identifying a particular challenge with recommendations. So we're really excited to launch this work and really work in partnership um, with uh, different leaders within Snohomish. And um, we will be we will be um, addressing different issues. And like I said, we're 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 right in the middle of this work. Um, and I want to just offer that if people would like to hear more information about this work, um, I'll be I'll be um, sending or in the chat, providing my email, and I'm also going to provide a, um, a one pager about the work as well. So that's just a little a, a, a teaser of what we're about to do. And what and the, to address the immediate question, I'm already identifying and connecting with local chambers, uh, uh, chamber of commerce throughout um, Snohomish County to really educate and, and share with what we're doing and why it's important and the connection. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Demi. Uh, Leadership Council information, additional stuff from um, uh, additional resources from everyone here will go out in the follow up email afterwards. So, yes, look for that. Um, I want to get to one more question to Marie and then I'll we'll get to the question in the chat that popped up. Um, so, Marie. What innovative models or programs have you seen that successfully integrate childcare solutions with workforce needs? Well, that is a big one. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I think that we have, uh, Imagine Hut was created in 2016, and our main priority was really supporting this workforce, the early childhood workforce. And through that, we have launched a um, system where they're really involved in creating the solutions. So I think they really contribute to the success of our work. They determine really what is needed to be successful from professional development, the types and kind and competencies, um, to programs that will meet the needs in their community. And since childcare providers are in their community, they really are a good ear to the ground of what's happening and what families need. What are families requesting? So we've opened about 700 new childcare businesses across Washington state. And that is really exciting. But you can see from the data that Soleil shared, we are still experiencing a childcare desert. And some of that work, I think that what you, we've heard today from the other panelists is the cost of doing business is really high 
and the pay is still really low for for child care workforce and so it doesn't really make sense but i i just the analogy that i heard recently was so good when you think about public school the child care ratio is you know or child to teacher ratio is 1 to 20 ish 17 to 25 in child care it averages about 1 to 6 so if that helps you kind of frame that um, feasibility estimator, um, that might be helpful. I think some of the some of the things that contribute to the most success are really designing with the people who are impacted. So in addition to childcare providers, Imagine does in-depth work with organizations and community partners and municipalities to say, what are the challenges? So an example I'd love to share in Snohomish County is the Machinist Institute, who is a statewide organization supporting um, career pathways and recruiting to apprenticeships and good living wage jobs in Washington State, but particularly in Snohomish County is my, my focus for this conversation. We're really trying to figure out what what can we do? We want all of these people want to work, but they don't have access to child care. That's a barrier for them. And so they launched a kind of a series of three different things. Many machinists work non-standard hours. And child care typical hours are kind of between six and six, six a.m. to six p.m. So they really wanted to dive deep into that. We did some survey work. We talked to those workers, uh, people already in the job, and we heard pretty loud and clear that they needed non-standard hour care. Some of those families wanted family child care. They wanted child care close to where they live. Some wanted child care close to home or close to work, and they all needed more flexibility. Uh, to meet their family's needs. So some of that work was a design team of those workers to say, here's what would be great for us. Um, another one was working with childcare providers to what do you need to be able to offer these non-standard hours? How do you meet the Washington Administrative Code for overnight care or for extended hour care? What kind of staffing do you need to make that work? And so we really worked and dove in and, and designed, I think, a system that can be work work for everyone. Um, in this case, they're also building a child care center. So uh, Snohomish County, thank you so much. And uh, Department of Commerce for the Early Learning Facilities Grant that are really helping to support this organization to build a non-standard hour child care in zip code 98204 um, that will serve the county over anticipating that that will open in 2025. Um, it's still in design phase, but their plan is to be able to maintain market rates, serve low income families and be open to the community. In addition to that, I think one of the other things that Imagine is doing that is really closing a gap is we have a shared services hub. Of the 3,200-ish licensed child cares in our state, both family homes and centers, about 1,700 of them have joined our shared services hub. There, those providers have access to business supports. Um, they also have opportunities to come together to work on solutions and support each other. Uh, it's a professional network for them where they can get support and help and access to things like QuickBooks or electronic attendance systems or professional development or a better understanding of how to implement different strategies to support the community and the children in their care. All of our programs are also available in multiple languages. And I think that that is really important that professional development is delivered in a language that you can deeply understand 
so that you can take that and apply it in your programs. Um, there's so much more I'd like to say, <laughs> but one of them is for businesses. And if we have any builders or contractors here um, or landlords, one big barrier that we haven't talked about yet is operating a family child care business in a home that is a rental. Or if there is a multifamily unit being built, how we can create family child care business opportunities within those communities. Um, it really is uh, licensed child care is well regulated and they're going to take good care of the home, even though they are a whole bunch of little ones running around. Um, but we do see a significant number of landlords not allowing this in um, rental units. So opening that up and thinking about liability insurance and some of those things that protect the owner as well as the provider is helpful and builders opening up space that has maybe just one big room with a bathroom and a small kitchenette in addition to family living quarters would be amazing. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Marie. Lots of innovative solutions. Um, we are super short on time, but I wanted to give, see if we can work in a soleil, a policy, a 30 second, uh, um, yes. healthcare policies <laughs> and it maybe tied with just cop question in the chat about, uh, you know, how can underserved communities, they might not be able to afford it financial constraints. What are we doing to, to address some of this? Yeah, that's a great question, Jeff. So, um, and we can maybe add in the chat uh, as well. So for low-income families that can go up to 85% state median income at the, at the cap, uh, there's the Working Connections Child Care Subsidy. So you can uh, get subsidized child care um, to, uh, to assist in the payment. That's basically a voucher you take to your child care program. Um, and, and on the other hand, child care programs need to, to accept the voucher. So that's two parts to that system. Also, child care programs need to exist, right? So we can provide that assistance to the families, but also that that supply needs to be there. And that is often the issue. So now we have um, expanded that access in terms of the subsidy. But as far as supply goes, that's what we're talking about today. We, how do we expand that? Um, and, and certainly there are many providers who accept that voucher and who are welcome um, those families and children. Um, so let me share... Am I missing something okay. in the chat? You have like yeah. 10 seconds. I got a little more. Okay. Up, but sorry. I, you know, you're great. I think all I, the only thing I'd want to say is as a state, we're really headed towards thinking about how can we um, have more universal access to childcare. And that includes a few things. If you can see this, my slide here, uh, making uh, cost capped at 7% of family income and also providing living wages for the workforce. Uh, and so many partners are working together on this. And, uh, and really what we also need is business and employers to work together. You all can't solve it on your own in your business. We can't solve it on our own. We have to work together. We need broader change and we need the voice of business at the table, uh, speaking to wonderful legislators and representatives saying this is important and here's what we need so that we can get broader um, support, policy and investments in the system. Back Thank you, you Soleil. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and and Guy up in Whatcom County, yes, uh, you've been doing a great job in leading the conversation over there. Happy to continue that conversation uh, up and down the I-5 corridor. Okay, so let's close this out. Uh, we want to thank our panel, excellent panel of experts for joining us today. Uh, for those of you who registered for today's installment of Coffee Chats, please check your inbox later today for a list of resources from the discussion, as well as a link to the recording. Um, and those who've been watching via Facebook and other live streaming, thank you. Uh, before we go, we have a couple announcements from EASC. Coming up August 29th, uh, EASC is teaming with the, up with the City of Lake Stevens and the Greater Lake Stevens Chamber of Commerce to bring you the 14th annual Summer Networking. Join us at the beautiful mill on Lake Stevens for an evening of food, fun, games, and of course, networking. 
Uh, please visit economicalliancesc.org slash events for more information. And don't miss the hottest networking event of the year. I think they mean temperature. Um, <laughs> calling all entrepreneurs on September 10th. Economic Alliance Snohomish County, in partnership with Coastal Community Bank, brings you the Business Builder Expo. From 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., please join us at Everett Community College's Henry M. Jackson Conference Center for a day full of workshops, panel discussions, and resources curated to assist entrepreneurs at, entrepreneurs at every stage of their business development. Start, scale, and grow your business with the help of our expert presenters and resource representatives. Again, economicalliancesc.org slash events for more information. And to conclude, please get your coffee mugs ready and let us adjust to the gallery view so we may see all of your faces. And let's raise our coffees and cheers to another great discussion this morning. Thank you all, oh my mugs, uh, thank you all for joining us. And until next time, have a great Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs>